then you'll get the best of every one of them. The best. The best chemist to study the chemistry of the soils on Mars. The best biologist looking for life in, the, in, the, in Europa. One of the moons of Jupiter that has a, that the ice has melted. It's a liquid ocean, been liquid for a billion years. I want to go ice fishing on Europa. <laughs> you find life on Europa? Here's, a, here's, a, here's an interesting unresolved question. What do you call that life? Would it be Europeans, right? Because it's Europa. You don't know. I don't know. We haven't worked that one out yet. So, um, in that way, and by the way, you can think of that, you might say, well, what good is that for the rest of us? Well, it's actually an investment in security. If you, if you have the best biologist, the best chem the next bioterrorism attack, they're there for you. You just tap them on the shoulder. We, get, we need help. They'll, they're there. Because you had them. They're there. And the whole industry that builds up around it, it tr it'll transform society and culture. We have a 21st century that would live the dreams that we all knew we had in the 20th. Okay? That's right. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Neil. Um, Hello. I'm curious into the nature of time. And Newton distinguished between absolute and physical time. And Einstein's theory of relativity supposedly um, falsifies his notion of absolute time. And, but I've recently heard the objection that this is uh, grounded in a verificationist epistemology, which is... I don't ever want to use the word epistemology. Okay. Find some other word in that sentence. Um, that's, people who use the word epistemology have one too many philosophy classes, well, okay? you're talking to a philosophy The problem with philosophy major, so. class is they don't take place in a laboratory where you actually measure things about the actual universe. And so you get whipped up into a frenzy of vocabulary right. and the premise that you're actually discovering the natural world. But in fact, you're not. I'm just telling you, okay. you're not. So, that's why philosophy has made no contributions to the advance of the physical understanding of the universe in the 20th century. Okay, no, sorry. Let me, make, let me make a better statement. There is no philosopher trained from the 20th century onward who's actually advanced our understanding of the natural world. It's left philosophy behind. And so, so if you're worried about the epistemological nature of time, I, I, I don't care. I just, it's not... Take it back to the philosophy class where you can have really good arguments about it. My favorite definition of time is, is Einstein's definition of time. He said, as you, you probably know this, it's time is defined to make motion look simple. And I'm good with that. I'm done with time at that point. I, but I interrupted, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, for example, it, it, when I look at this picture, um, maybe to switch gears a little bit, I see um, things, I, I don't see what's happening right now, but Correct. I'm looking, I'm peering into the past. You see things not there, but as they once were, because it took time were. for light to get here, yes. Okay, and um, what, what is happening sort of simultaneously? 15 billion light years away. Um, g given that you know, the general conception is that the the universe sort of started 14, 15 billion years ago and was much smaller than it was today, and it's expanding. What are we sort of peering at when we see the cosmic uh, microwaves um, from the Big Bang 15 billion years ago? Are we looking at ourselves from the past? No, we're looking at another part of the case. universe at that age, not ourselves. We're not looking at ourselves in the past. That's not possible. We're looking at a galaxy that today would look like our galaxy, but 15 billion years ago is when the, that galaxy was born. So we are seeing that galaxy being born right now. In the same way, a galaxy 65 million light years away, <coughs> looking at us with super duper telescopes, what would they see on Earth? They would see what happened on Earth. 65 million years ago, and they watched the dinosaurs saying, maybe now we should build a space program for this. <laughs> so, 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 yes, you are seeing the past, and you can reach a point where you see the beginning of the universe, and the cosmic microwave background is the, is the, the thermal effluence of the first half a million years of the universe. 
So it is. You were actually looking back in time. And beyond that, we cannot see because the universe wasn't born yet. The light, there's not enough time elapsed in the universe for anything beyond that to have reached us yet. And so our horizon, though real, is nonetheless expanding at one light year per year. Thank you. Okay. Yes, that was a longer answer, I'm sorry, but we can get through these. We'll get through these here. Okay, good. Yes. Um, my question is actually about... We have about six questions left, and I'll be quick. <laughs> go. go. And I didn't think I'd say this, but it's actually less complicated than that. Um, my okay. question is about gamma ray bursts, uh -huh. and if you think that, first of all, if they caused the mass extinction of the trilobites, and if they're like a threat, should we be scared of them? Should we be afraid of gamma ray bursts? Um, another quickie commercial. In the book, Death by a Black Hole, there's a section called, When the Universe Turns Bad. All the ways the cosmos wants to kill us. And one of those chapters is all about gamma ray bursts. Uh, gamma ray bursts is the largest explosion known in the universe. What we know of them thus far is that they're explosions where stars are being born. They're extremely rare, but highly potent and very beamed. So you could be near a gamma ray burst and not know it, because the beam would go to the side of you rather than at you. But if it comes at you, it is devastating to anything in its path. If there's a gamma ray burst in our own galaxy pointed towards Earth, the high energy rays would knock out our ozone layer. It's like armies that first would take out the ozone layer, then the next wave would come right on down to the surface of the Earth. And everyone, uh, especially those with lighter skin, would immediately get skin cancer. And the, what you would have to do is shield yourself from the light that's coming in. So go underground, go indoors, and stay there until the burst was done. Then when it's done, you're still missing the ozone. The ozone has to replenish itself to then continue to protecting you from the sun. So this would be a bad day on Earth. Um, so uh, you asked, should we be worried about it? There's no known, there's no obvious place in the galaxy that looks like it could become a gamma ray burst anytime soon. So I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I worry about it like crossing the street, wearing a seatbelt, that sort of thing. <laughs> With a higher concern than the rest. But the other part of that question was what about the gamma ray burst? If you think that it was one could have been responsible oh, for a sure, mass extinction. Sure, sure. I think, you know, we know there are these mass extinctions in the fossil records. And so everybody's looking for ways to bump off the trilobites, the dinosaurs, the everybody's looking for ways. And that's it's a perfectly valid way. It would do what people say it would do. The question is whether it actually happened. And it's not obvious how you would measure that, whether there's sort of a signature of gamma ray exposed rock at that layer. You have to sort of analyze that. And it's the, so the jury's still out on that. But it's available in case you need a way to have killed off the trilobites. Okay. Okay, yeah. Say we launch another Voyager. If you had to put together a solid gold hard disk to get sent out of the solar system, what would you put on it? <laughs> okay, you might remember the Voyager spacecraft. It was the, the Voyager 1 and 2 was the third and fourth spacecraft to achieve escape velocity of the solar system. And given that fact, the designers of it, including Carl Sagan and his collaborators, put, a, put content on this physical spacecraft on the possibility that it would be recovered by aliens, intelligent aliens, who would then interpret what's on that gold disk and it will tell them about us. So some of the things on the disk was our return address. It would show where we were in the galaxy, which I found to be odd. Because you don't give your home address to strangers in the street who, who are your own species. Now here we are going out to who knows where, and it's going to be picked up by who knows whom. Tell them exactly where we came from. So I'm just saying, I, I don't mind the gesture, it's just odd that the same people would not give their address to a stranger here, of your own species. So that second, the illustration showed the trajectory of the path of the spacecraft, this was launched in the 70s, showed the trajectory, so it has an a, a, a etched circle, that's the sun, and then it has Mercury, Venus, Earth, and it showed the spacecraft coming off of the Earth, and then it had um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, my very educated mother, Jessica, uh, Uranus, and it has
has Pluto. Pluto's there. And I thought to myself, and if I, I write about this in the Pluto files, I say, aliens today, if they picked that up, they would not associate that with our solar system. Because there are seven moons in the solar system bigger than Pluto, not shown in that diagram. So this could not be our solar system because it's, <clears throat> if Pluto were actually the size given, it's like almost the size of Earth. When in fact Pluto would fit between like New York and Colorado, okay? So that would, you'd have to update sort of a, more sensibly what that image is. Uh, now the record player had uh, music, it had Beethoven on it, it had Chuck Berry. Uh, there was a funny comic, uh, was it at Saturday Night Live? It might have been Saturday Night Live. It shows aliens. They find the spacecraft, and they send a message back. And NASA gets it. They say, well, please read the spacecraft. It says, send more Chuck Berry. <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> Another funny thing is, on that, on that record album is etched, there's a, uh, two human forms, a male and female. And the man has a hand raised, and then they're both there standing. And so there's another comic. That's <laughs> So the alien finds it and runs to the, to the lab and says, look, they're just like us, except they don't wear clothes. <laughs> so anyhow, um, that Voyager record also had the heartbeat of an unborn infant. It had people saying hello in 50 languages. They parked a microphone outside of the UN in New York to get people to do that. So it was a very it was a magnanimous gesture. Uh, if I were to put an updated version of that on there, I still include Chuck Berry, definitely. Um, I think music is good. It should show our culture, who and what we are. So music, maybe some art, put it like some classical art there, maybe a Picasso, some, something more modern. Uh, I would uh, I'd put up some of our icons of science, the periodic table, our DNA molecule, our uh, things like that. That's what I would do. Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> Uh, about the uh, killer asteroid, so it's supposed to make two passes. Are you right? really worried about the killer asteroid? <laughs> well, I was just more curious about the procedure, how we we'll okay. go about this. So, two passes, yes. Yeah, and, and so on the first one, that's when we determine whether or not it's actually going to come back and hit us. It's possible to actually determine before then. Before then. But I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah, go on. Okay, well, I was just wondering um, how soon would, would uh, if we're going to try deflecting it, would we try, would we try on the first pass, or is it not feasible yet? If you don't deflect it, bef no, so this is the asteroid Apophis. Named for the Egyptian god of death and darkness. <laughs> Named after its orbit was determined to have Earth in its sights. Obviously, because then that's why you would name it that. <laughs> we didn't name it Tiffany, you know. <laughs> or Bambi. <laughs> so, um, it's the size of the Rose Bowl. And on Friday the 13th, in April, 2029, it'll make a close approach to Earth, dipping below our Earth orbiting communication satellites. It'll be the biggest, closest thing ever seen in recorded history. We know it will not hit Earth, but we don't know the trajectory well enough to say whether it will go through what we're calling the keyhole, a very small percentage of the total possible trajectories it could have. If it goes through the keyhole, it will hit Earth seven years later. If it goes through the keyhole and then you want to deflect it, you have to deflect it an entire Earth radius to get it out of our sights. If you deflect it before the keyhole, you just have to deflect it out of the keyhole. The keyhole is a magnifying effect where Earth's gravity will take its trajectory and ensure that it hits us the next time around. You want to do it before 2029 takes place. If you don't and it hits, it'll hit the, um, and if it goes through the center of the keyhole, it'll hit the Pacific Ocean, plunge in to a depth of three miles, explode, cavitate the ocean, a hole three miles wide, three miles deep. The first impact will send a tsunami 50 feet tall, rushing towards the shores. It'll ablate clean the entire west coast of the United States. It'll ablate it in the following way. The first wave comes, meanwhile there's a hole in the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> So water doesn't like having a hole in it. So the walls of water collapse back in, it sloshes into itself, rises high into the sky, falls back down, cavitates it again. <laughs> There's another tsunami wave that comes. This continues for about 45 minutes. 
And so one wave after another separated by about a minute. So the first wave comes in, but it doesn't keep going. It gets sucked back out, ready for the second wave. So it only goes in maybe a quarter mile. So you can watch all this happen at a safe distance inland, okay? You can have like a, you know, the rope, so that everybody stays behind the rope, okay, and watches. So the first wave comes in, goes through the homes, the multi-million dollar Malibu homes. Then the water comes out again with the same speed it came in. But this time it like brings the houses with them. And then the next wave brings the houses back. And so now the houses have a slightly different shape, okay? And so this continues and all of civilized constructed properties become this churning ablative mass of debris, which basically sandblasts or whatever the word is for churning debris. It just ablate clean the entire west coast of the United States. By the time it gets to the Pacific Rim, it'll be much subdued by then, but it would still be bad in Hawaii and in Japan and up in the Aleutians. So, nobody has to die from this because we would know well in advance, you just evacuate the entire west coast. That's all. No, but two people would die. The surfer who wants to do the... <laughs> The stupid surfer, <laughs> dead person number one. Dead person number two, the stupid weatherman. You know the one who said, come closer, Joe. The hurricane is right here. Can you see? Two dead people, that's it. <laughs> okay? That, that does it, thank you. Okay, uh, so what, what I want to do, what we need to do is get a transponder on Apophis to tell us that beams, it's, it's like Lojack for Apophis, right? It beams its location, tells us exactly where it is accurate to centimeters. Then we can know whether or not it goes through the keyhole. Because if it doesn't go through the keyhole, we don't have to go rescue Earth and call Bruce Willis, you know? We can let that one go. Currently, it's not funded. But if it does, if it is headed for us, we would deflect it. We have plans on paper to do that. Okay. Cool, thank you. Yes, okay. By the way, to the people, the generals who know we've got like bombs in the silo, just blow that sucker out of the sky. You know, you know that crumb, the kind I'm talking about. These guys that like hitch up their pants and then say what to bomb. All right. <laughs> so those guys. Here's the problem with blowing it out of the sky because if you deflect it, it lives to see another day. You got to keep your eye on it because it still continues to cross Earth's orbit. So here's the problem. America is really good at blowing stuff up. <laughs> we are less good at knowing what happens to the pieces after we blow them up. So that's the problem here, all right? So an explosion could cleave the asteroid into two pieces. Now you have to evacuate both coasts or something. Oh, you know, so whereas, whereas you, if you deflect it, it's a continuous, uh, um, scenario, you can monitor how it's doing, you can check it out, and so that's the preferred, that's what you want to do. Okay, yeah, right here. Curious, what's your opinion on M theory or string theory? That is to say, do you feel that it could be the, you know, theory of unification or is it just a theoretical pipe dream, in your opinion? Right now? It's smelling a lot, very, smelling pipe dreamy, I think. I've been following these guys for 27 years. And every five years, I ask them, how much longer? <laughs> and they say, just a couple more years. And I ask them every five years, just a couple more years. So I did this in 1982, 87, 91, you know, and so something's wrong here. And they say, well, it's a hard problem to unify all the forces of the world and put everything under one equation and make it all the beautiful vibrating strings. It's hard. That's the answer they give rather than, we're just too stupid. <laughs> General relativity was hard. It was done by one man. It took him nine years. We had experimental proof three years later. I'm ready for another idea from them. But they're the only game in town, and they're really inexpensive. You just buy a few pencils for them, maybe a sharpener. <laughs> they're good to go. <laughs> Throw in a laptop. Fine. They're not in anybody's way. So I'm, not, I'm okay with that. Okay? But I'm no longer their champion. I used to speak praises of them. I don't... Uh, and, and just because they want it to be elegant doesn't mean the universe agrees. Right? 
most efforts to layer onto the universe our own sense of what is elegant have failed from the very beginning of thinking about the universe. So I'm losing my confidence, but I don't volunteer that fact. It has to be asked of me, as you just did. Okay. The last two questions. Last one question. Yes, sir. What are, what are your thoughts on the inauguration of the first technologically literate president in a generation and what that implies for the future of American science research? Okay, excellent question. Um, um, McCain was certainly not technologically literate. In four of his debates, he kept referring to the $3 million overhead projector at the planetarium. I think, he, look, as an earmark, he, I think he was thinking about the old-fashioned overhead projector where you put slides, transparencies on it. If that had cost $3 million, that'd be a problem. But high-precision optical planetarium projectors that show the night sky to millions of people a year in school children, this, I think there was a disconnect there. Some, somebody didn't understand something. Okay. Uh, so, yes, it's a phase shift, as we say, in, the, in what can happen in America given Obama's technological background. By the way, he wrote a paper for his law review. I forgot what the, what the, the, Har the Harvard Law Review. No, but I forgot what, is it his senior thesis paper? Is it some paper where he explored the role of quantum mechanics in the thinking of law proceedings? There was some, it was a stretch, but the fact that there was physics in it at all, I'll take it, I'll, t I'll take it. <laughs> I'm taking it, but just bring it on. All right. Um, what's funny is uh, the way you pose that question. Uh, I'm asked. I was asked by the press, by people. So they said things like, "What an historic day Tuesday was, wasn't it?" And so I say, "Yes, it was an historic day." For the first time in, you know, more than a decade, okay, or even longer, I say for the first, I, I said for the first time we have a president. Now they expect me to say, oh, we have a black president. That's what makes it stark. No, that's not what makes it a stark. What makes it a stark is that we proved that America can elect a brilliant person to lead us. Okay, that is something that had not been demonstrated. It hadn't been demonstrated. But it's an important fact because for a while there, it was, there was fear of the brilliant people because people felt that if you were brilliant, you didn't represent them. And so Bush, who no one ever mistook for a brilliant person, <laughs> was warmly liked by 60 million people because they felt he was who they would like invite to Thanksgiving dinner. And I agree with that. Okay? I was at the White House. I, I'm three times appointed by the guy. All right? And you're in his presence. You feel really comfortable around him. He's like a friendly guy. He makes eye contact. He remembers your name. And so if that's who you want to lead you, that gives you a certain kind of country. Different from if you elected somebody who's smarter than you are. Okay, and so that was a phase shift in electoral politics. And to boot, he's young enough to be computer literate, he's got a, uh, a PDA that he walks around with, so this makes for interesting times, especially given the role that the technologically literate society will need to play bringing us forward into the 21st century. There you have my view. Well, thank you once again. Thank you. And thank you to the top row. <laughs>